Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. And we now turn in your hymnals to page 1064, 1065 and following. We are now going to be working with the section that from your textbook, again the Fitzgerald translation of the Odyssey, we call this the land of the dead. Now put this in your notes really quickly. While your textbook company, and I think this is an oversight on, on the textbook company's uh, um, decision, they should, I think, be telling you what book we, uh, numbers we're working with from the Odyssey. We are now in Odyssey book 11. This is the famous journey to the underworld of Odysseus. Now in your senior year, of course, we'll be reading the Odyssey together and formally studying it. And we will recognize then, we'll say it again, that this is one of the most important passages of all of the Odyssey. Odysseus will be telling, of course, the, um, Alcyonus, that when he was on this journey and they had had these adventures, ultimately he ended up at the island of Circe, sometimes pronounced Kirky, the witch. And she turned all of Odysseus's men into pigs, which, of course, some girls say all men are anyway. And she tries to turn Odysseus into a pig, and would have, except he had the help of Hermes. Odysseus then stays at the island of Circe for a couple of years doing homework. Okay, I'm just going to leave it at that. And at some point, Circe says to Odysseus, because she's told she has to let him go, that he has to go to hell. Which is, of course, kind of today, kind of an insult, but it comes from this Odyssey, where Odysseus actually goes into the underworld for a very specific reason. I'll say three things really quickly for your notes. One, it is a badge of honor in ancient epic poetry if you are an epic hero and you go into the underworld for obvious reasons, right? In other words, you go into the underworld and somehow you get out. Number two, there are two other trips to the underworld that are very famous in epic poetry. We'll study both of them in your senior year, but I'm setting you up for that study now. One of those is from the great poem, The Aeneid, by Virgil, where the Roman hero, the Trojan warrior, Aeneas, has a journey into the underworld as well. The second one is the great poet Dante, who writes a famous poem called The Divine Comedy, namely broken up into three parts. And the first part is called Inferno, where Dante the pilgrim takes a journey into hell where he gets to meet all these different people and have all these different conversations, okay? By the way, the other two parts of Dante's classic, uh, part two, Purgatorio, part three, Paradiso, or heaven, okay? So we, this is one of those kind of landmark moments in epic poetry when you have a hero who goes into the underworld, finally. The reason he's down there is not sightseeing. And his men are none too pleased to go into the underworld with him. Because, hello, that's where the dead live. By the way, just so you have this in your notes, we're not talking with Hades. We're not talking about hell in any kind of Christian understanding of that term. For the Greeks, when you die, your suke, or your soul, or your spirit, goes to the underworld. Everybody goes to the underworld. It's not a place of torture for bad guys unless you've done something really, really bad, like Sisyphus, who has to push that huge rock up a hill, and the moment he thinks that he's got it to the top, it rolls back down over him, and then he's got to go all the way down to the bottom, and he's got to push it up again. One or two freshmen have said, that's a good working metaphor for what I have to do in 303. Right about the time I get, I think I'm finally accomplished. The big boulder rolls over me, and i got to start all over again. That's Sisyphus down there in Hades. But for most people who go to Hades, it's not a place of torture. It's just a crummy place to be. You'd much rather be alive than be dead down in Hades. But Odysseus has to go there. Why? Primarily to visit with the blind prophet Tiresias. Now, what makes Tiresias special is that he can see both the past as well as the future. Tiresias, then, will tell Odysseus some important information about his homecoming. More particularly, some bad news. Bad news about he and his men, and bad news about what's going on back in Ithaca, where now, for 20 years, Odysseus has been gone, and his wife Penelope 
is starting to think, along with his son Telemachus, he's not coming home. And there's some bad guys back in Ithaca who are trying to convince his wife Penelope he has to take, she has to take another husband. And so all of that is going to transpire as well. When Odysseus then leaves the land of the underworld, he is not the same Odysseus that he was when he went in, because now he has knowledge. Of course, that knowledge will kind of make him sad, all right? So we now turn, again, we're on page uh, 1064. Let's just do the reading, and then we'll come back to do a quick annotation of this one, all right? Here we go. The Land of the Dead. Odysseus and his men sailed to Aeolia, where Aeolus, king of the winds, sends Odysseus on his way with a gift, a sack containing all the winds except the favorable west wind. When they are near home, Odysseus's men open the sack, letting loose a storm that drives them back to Aeolia. Aeolus casts them out, having decided that they are detested by the gods. They sail seven days and arrive in the land of the Lestragonians, a race of cannibals. These creatures destroy all of Odysseus's ships except the one he is sailing in. Odysseus and his reduced crew escape and reach Ea, the island ruled by the sorceress goddess Circe. She transforms half of the men into swine. Protected by a magic herb, Odysseus demands that Circe change his men back into human form. Before Odysseus departs from the island, a year later, Circe informs him that in order to reach home, he must journey to the land of the dead, Hades, and consult the blind prophet Tiresias. All right, here we go now. We're ready. We bore down on the ship at the sea's edge and launched her on the salt immortal sea, stepping our mast and spar in the black ship embarked the ram and you, and went aboard in tears with bitter and sore dread upon us. But now a breeze came up for us astern, a canvas bellying land breeze, hail shipmate sent by the singing nymph with sunbright hair. So we made fast the braces, took our thwarts, and let the wind and steersman work the ship with full sails spread all day above our coursing, till the sun dipped, and all the ways grew dark upon the fathomless, unresting sea. By night, our ship ran onward toward the ocean's bourne, the realm and region of the men of winter, hidden in mist and cloud. Never the flaming eye of Helios lights on those men at morning when he climbs the sky of stars, nor in descending earthward out of heaven. Ruinous night being rove over those wretches. We made the land, put Ram and you ashore, and took our way along the ocean stream to find the place foretold for us by Circe. There, Perimedes and Eurylochus pinioned the sacred beasts. With my drawn blade, I spaded up the votive pit and poured libations round it to the unnumbered dead. Sweet milk and honey, then sweet wine, and last, clear water. And I scattered barley down. Then I addressed the blurred and breathless dead, vowing to slaughter my best heifer for them before she calved at home in Ithaca and burned the choice bits on the altar fire. As for Tiresias, I swore to sacrifice a black lamb, handsomest of all our flock. Thus, to assuage the nations of the dead, I pledged these rites, then slashed the lamb and you letting their black blood stream into the well pit. Now the souls gathered, stirring out of Erebus, brides and young men, and men grown old in pain, and tender girls whose hearts were new to grief. Many were there, too, torn by brazen lanceheads, battle-slain, bearing still their bloody gear. From every side they came and sought the pit with rustling cries, and I grew sick with fear. But presently I gave command to my officers to flay those sheep the bronze cut down, and make burnt offerings of flesh to the gods below, to sovereign death, to pale Persephone. Meanwhile I crouched with my drawn sword to keep the surging phantoms from the bloody pit 
till I should know the presence of Tiresias. One shade came first, Elpinor of our company, who lay unburied still on the wide earth as we had left him, dead in Circe's hall, untouched, unmourned, when other cares compelled us. Now when I saw him there, I wept for pity and called out to him, How is this, Elpinor? How could you journey to the western gloom swifter afoot than I in the black lugger? He sighed and answered, Son of great Laertes, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, bad luck shadowed me and no kindly power. Ignoble death I drank with so much wine. I slept on Circe's roof, then could not see the long, steep, backward ladder coming down and fell that height. My neck bone, buckled under, snapped, and my spirit found this well of dark. Now hear the grace I pray for, in the name of those back in the world, not here. Your wife and father, he who gave you bread in childhood, and your own child, your only son, Telemachus, long ago left at home. When you make sail and put these lodgings of dim death behind, you will moor ship, I know, upon Iia Island. There, O oh my Lord, remember me, I pray. Do not abandon me unwept, unburied, to tempt the gods' wrath while you sail for home. But fire my corpse and all the gear I had and build a cairn for me above the breakers, an unknown sailor's mark for men to come. Keep up the mound there, and implant upon it the oar I pulled in life with my companions. He ceased, and I replied, Unhappy spirit, I promise you the barrow and the burial. So we conversed and grimly at a distance, with my longsword between, guarding the blood while the faint image of the lad spoke on. Now came the soul of Anticlea, dead, my mother, daughter of Otolycus, dead now, though living still when I took ship for holy Troy. Seeing this ghost, I grieved, but held her off through pang on pang of tears, till I should know the presence of Tiresias. Soon from the dark that prince of Thebes came forward bearing a golden staff, and he addressed me. Son of Laertes and the gods of old, Top of 1068. Odysseus, master of landways and seaways, why leave the blazing sun, O man of woe, to see the cold dead and the joyless region? Stand clear, put up your sword. Let me but taste the blood. I shall speak true. At this, I stepped aside, and in the scabbard let my long sword ring home to the pummel silver as he bent down to the somber blood. Then spoke the prince of those with gift of speech. Great captain, a fair wind and the honey lights of home are all you seek. But anguish lies ahead. The god who thunders on the land prepares it, not to be shaken from your track, implacable, in rancor for the sun whose eye you blinded. One narrow strait may take you through his blows. Denial of yourself, restraint of shipmates. When you make landfall on Thrinacia first and quit the violet sea, Dark on the land you'll find the grazing herds of Helios, by whom all things are seen, all speech is known. Avoid these kind. Hold fast to your intent, and hard seafaring brings you all to Ithaca. But if you raid the beeves, I see destruction for ship and crew. Though you survive alone, bereft of all companions, lost for years, under strange sail shall you come home to find your own house filled with trouble, insolent men, eating your livestock as they court your lady. Aye, you shall make those men atone in blood. But after you have dealt out death, 
in open combat or by stealth to all the suitors, go overland on foot and take an oar. Until one day you come where men have lived with meat unsalted, never known the sea, nor seen seagoing ships with crimson bows and oars that fledge light hulls for dipping flight. The spot will soon be plain to you, and I can tell you how. Some passerby will say, What winnowing fan is that upon your shoulder? Halt, and implant your smooth oar in the turf and make fair sacrifice to Lord Poseidon. A ram, a bull, a great buck boar. Turn back and carry out pure hecatombs at home to all wide heaven's lords, the undying gods, to each in order. Then a sea-born death, soft as this hand of mist, will come upon you when you are wearied out with rich old age, your country folk in blessed peace around you. And all this shall be just as I foretell. All right, let's turn quickly now just to a quick uh, annotation of this passage starting at level one. Let's work through it quickly and then jump to level two and three. The first observations that we want to make really quickly is that notice right away on 1064, there is serious dread about going into the underworld. So, in other words, this is not like, yippee, we get to go see what no other human eyes have ever seen, but rather the fear is we go down there, we never get to come back, right? Okay, and so there's a lot of fear. They will sail down there, and then on page 1065, they begin the process of the sacrifice. The blood, why is blood important? Because it will attract uh, those ghosts who will then come. But notice, he's there to see specifically Tiresias, so he's got to kind of guard the pool of blood. He can't allow just all of them uh, all of them to come, right? Okay, and the souls are all kind of gathering. Notice we've got some that are, we're told at line 568, battle slain, bearing still their bloody gear. Here immediately we think, of course, of the Iliad, don't we? And all of those, all those men who died at the walls of Troy. He says, at line 570, I, I grew sick with fear. He's still waiting on the presence of Tiresias. Elpinor shows up. Now, this is important because Elpinor, is, is, we're told earlier, is the one in our story. When they were at the island of Circe, they lost him. He was sleeping up on the roof, and he went to sleep, and then he rolled off the roof, and he fell down, and he broke his neck, and he died. And so that's why he's down there. Notice right away, there's some pity, and Odysseus will cry. And then you have this exchange on page 1067 really quickly where he calls it bad luck, right? And then he asks, remember me, and would you please build a mound for me? Put a note for yourself at 3A that when we in our senior year study the great Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf, at the very end of that poem, Beowulf will die fighting a dragon. Right before he dies, he will ask to be remembered through a barrel, a lighthouse, to be built out on the edge of the cliff. So we'll come back to this kind of thing, right? Notice Odysseus does make a promise. Did you notice that he sees his mother here? But note the irony. He cannot talk to her because he wants to make sure he gets his conversation with Tiresias. And so he doesn't even speak to his mother down in the underworld at this moment, right? Finally, Tiresias shows up. I'm on 1068 with you. He says right away, I will tell you the truth. And then he says, anguish lies ahead. So in other words, oh, yay, I get to go to hell or Hades. And while I'm down there, I get to talk to Tiresias, whose first words are, your future does not look good. As a matter of fact, serious amounts of anguish. He then will mention a narrow strait, right, that you have to go through. Denial of yourself, restraint of shipmates will be the next one, he says. By the way, the narrow straits will be for your notes, Scylla and Charybdis. We'll get to it in a bed. And then he says, you're going to end up on Helios' island, and whatever you do, don't touch the cows, right? Leave the cows alone. And of course, this is later, we're going to find out the major problem, right? Finally, we're told that you're going to sail under a strange sail. This is, of course, going to be the Phaeacians who will give him passage to Ithaca later. Remember, he's telling the story to the Phaeacians, right? 
And then he says, once you get there, you're going to have, he says at line um, 649 and 650, insolent men. Do you know this word, insolent? It means, in other words, mean, not kind. We will later, for your notes, call them the suitors. Suitors is just the translated word that became most famous, meaning men who are trying to marry Penelope. One of them, making Penelope choose. Of course, why do the men want Penelope? It isn't for sex, okay? It's not like she's drop-dead gorgeous. She's an old woman now. It's because she is the queen of Ithaca, and they want to run all of Ithaca. That's right. It's about money. You got it. And so the bad guys are going to be there. So he says, when you finally get home, and dude, it's going to take you a lot to get home. He suggests that by the time Odysseus gets home, he will have none of his pals with him. They'll all be dead. They'll all be gone. So, I mean, he gets that, he gets that info. And then he's told, when you arrive in, in, in Ithaca, you're going to have to fight for your life and for your wife. Great. Finally, after all of that, he says the last thing you got to do is remember, take an oar, walk far, far inland, and then sacrifice to Poseidon. Now, why does he need to do that? Well, Poseidon's mad at him. Why is Poseidon mad at him? That's the story of Polyphemus and the Cyclops, right? Okay. So when he says you finally get there, then after the sacrifice, go on page 1069, last lines. Then we're told, last four or five lines, a seaborn death soft as this hand of mist will come upon you when you are wearied out with rich old age. And your country folk in blessed peace around you and all this shall be just as I foretold. In other words, they'll have a good death. Um, let's put this in our notes really quickly. The Greeks loved the hero Odysseus so much, they never gave him a death narrative. Achilles, we know how he, how he dies. Paris jacked him in the ankle with an arrow, right? Because his mama dipped him in sticks, but only one time. Um, we know how Agamemnon dies when he comes home from his little uh, war fiasco and Clytemnestra says, welcome home, honey. Here's what an ax feels like on your back, right? Okay. We know how Ajax, the great Ajax hero, dies. We have all the death narratives of most of the great heroes, none for Odysseus.